The Operation Pedestal was an operation that was only a small part of the bigger picture that was going on at the time. At this time, the North Africa campaign was underway from June 1940 to November 1942. And the Axis Command in the Mediterranean was centralised at the top and very fragmented at lower levels. In Italy, Benito Mussolini had monopolised authority over the Italian armed forces since 1933, taking the offices of the Minister of War, Navy and the Air Force. By 1940, his navy ranked fifth in the world. Six battleships, 20 cruisers, 61 destroyers, and over 100 submarines. However, his navy and air force did not collaborate in any actions. Similarly, the German inter-service wireless routes obstructed cooperation. The German ground forces were commanded by General Feldmarshal Albert Kisselwin of the Luftwaffe. Again, he'd been there since 1933 as Commander-in-Chief South. However, he had no authority over Axis operations in North Africa or the organisation of convoys in Libya. While a much abler commander than General Erwin Rommel, he lacked a grasp of air strategy. And he actually was blamed for the failure of the Battle of Britain and the German actions. However, he was a brilliant organiser with an iron will and an ardent, but he was a non-ideological Nazi. From when he assumed command until August 1942, he continued to lobby for the seizure of Malta by amphibious landing, spearheaded by paratroopers, the Volksmajaga. He argued his case in Berlin, influenced by his dislike, and his lack of authority over Rommel, whom he considered his prestige outweighed his ability. Kesselring was also subordinate to Kriegsmarine chain of command and only had authority to coordinate claims, combined operations by German and Italian forces. He did have some influence on the use of the Italian Air Force for the in Nautica for the protection of Axis convoys in the Mediterranean. However, the Italian Air Force insisted on using its own wireless wavelengths, even when its aircraft were airborne beside the Luftwaffe. So you get a bit of a sense of how all things were coordinated. When he arrived in Rome on the 28th of November 1941, Kessler immediately encountered the difficulties of coalition command with the Italians, as the Italian chief of staff declined to surrender the air resources to German control. So the Axis weren't really working together, were they? The Italian Navy also resisted all German attempts to integrate its operation, and ships in different squadrons never trained together, and the supermarine gun for the Italian naval hyperlines constantly overruled subordinate commanders. Kesselring called them a fair weather navy. <laughs> also, the Italian navy had difficulty receiving oil from Plexi in Romania through the Black Sea and Aegean and across the Adriatic. Hitler had owned Romania, but despite him promising to give oil to Italy, his promises were unfulfilled. Okay, now let's talk about Malta. The island of Malta, lying 800 miles northwest of Alexandria and over 900 miles from Gibraltar, was sitting in the middle of the critical axis of fire lines during this time. I haven't got the supply lines on there, but you can see Malta just above the Mediterranean. It's a tiny little island in the scheme of things, but it was right on the um, journey where the Axis supply lines into northern Africa would pass by. So it's a strategic location. It's always been a strategic location for the people. There was the view um, that if it was supplied with aircraft, bulk, fuel, and sufficient munitions, it could be capable of causing severe shortages to the German and Italian armies during the campaign. The opening of the new front in June in North Africa through 1940, increased Malta's already considerable value as Britain was waging war in the Mediterranean against the German Africa Corps and the Italian forces in North Africa. And Axis had air bases on Sardinia, Sicily, and Iberia, the North African mainland, the Tower of Italy, it held Greece, Crete, and parts of Libya, so it was very well positioned. In May 1941, Rommel warned that without, let me just see, um, without Malta, the Axis will end up losing control of North Africa. And by mid-1941, Malta was also being used as a base for supply of Egypt aircraft. 
From 1940 to 1942, the Axis conducted the siege of Malta with air and naval forces. While Malta was able to resist, ceased to be an offensive base for British ships, submarines and aircraft against the campaign for much of 1942. This was not the first time Malta had been besieged by, by other Roman force. During the Crusades in 1565, a religious order of the Knights of St John of Malta, led by Grand Master, he's fallen off. There is. Um, the Grand Master Jean Perisot de Valletta fought off an invasion by Muslim troops. A tiny band of 500 knights held off an invasion force of 20 times their size, led by the Ottoman Suleiman the Magnificent, who wanted Malta as a base for invading Europe. Now I'm just going to show you some photos of Malta. It's quite a, an incredible place. Um, some of these photos don't do it justice, but it's, this is the Holy Cathedral of St. John, which is very beautiful. Um, from the outside, it doesn't look much, but once you get inside. Uh, this is Peter Fari Martini, head of the Air Force in Delco. As you can see, the jacket didn't fit him, it's the smaller people. And uh, here's me standing outside the Wembley store. We had, I live in Wembley, so it was like the home again. Um, these are just some of the buildings, the view from our hotel. Uh, that's for St. Delmo, that's just another old building, just to give you a few. I was just talking to Joe before we started, and I said, there's so many places that we never went to when we went to Malta. And he said, well, I've been to Harvard the Liber, and he's been there quite a few times. It's quite an amazing place. On the 31st of December 1941, Kesselring unleashed 250 bombers and 165 against Malta, with the German and Italian navies blocking the sea routes. The Maltese called this the Black Winter, as Italians bombed by day and the Germans at night. 1,000 people killed and 3,500 The Maltese were actually being The Axis powers would deal a massive blow to Allied forces, while also showing their collective military might. Air attacks continued in the early months of 1942, escalated to, to big April, when the, the island was sometimes attacked by 200 air aircraft air in 24 hours, their twice by 300, when there were only six Spitfires left on Malta. The 46 Spitfires delivered by the U.S. carrier was still April, promptly destroyed. Still, the operation, along with its potential horrors, would fade On the 17th of March, 1942, Germany's Lieutenant General Enno von Hitler presented Mussolini, commander of the Supremo, with detailed plans for occupation of Malta. Malta's strategic However, Mussolini had sailed on both the war and his Teutonic allies, but he didn't know how to escape from the period that he had made and had his support to save. Among Malta. the graveyards that will someday be built, the following year, there will be one which will Axis be very powers test field marshal Albert Kesselring. The air, for, the air officer commanding in Malta for the period June 41 to 42 was Air Chief Marshal Shirley Gould, who was tasked with protecting the island from German and Italian air attacks, as well as attacking Axis shipping to deliver supplies to Rommel's African Corps in North Africa. However, his lack of knowledge of fighter tactics and the dominance of the British in BF 109 against the outdated Hawker Hurricane in Italy and the Germans in Italy against the Germans in Italy against the outdated Hawker Hurricane and his favouring defence rather than attack is considered to have prolonged the siege of Malta. In July 1942, Air Vice Marshal Keith Carter faced to secure any significant as a result of bad experience of fighter defences in the Egypt. Relief from air attacks only came when Kesselring's squadrons were sent north to support the summer defensive in Russia. Attempts in 1942 with the convoys of Operation Julius, which included Operation Carter and Operation Vigorous, were either a failure or relatively the unsuccessful to risk of flying in Malta. Indeed, between February and August 1942, 85 British cargo vessels sailed, the 24 sunk, 11 returned back, the third of all food and materials from Egypt, and 14 of the Italians, 11 of which came from the Commonwealth. These losses created tension between the three services in Britain, and there was criticism of Malta's leadership. And in the spring of 1942, British chiefs of staff urged the 8th Army to fast forward offensive in Libya to relieve pressure on Malta. An additional four cruiser Mark ones. Also, Hitler had become resigned to his Italian ally and burdened the war effort. 
By April, Mr. Mussolini had agreed to the Lotus first of the Forces of received the 12th Field Regiment from the British Army, which provided 24 88 mm cannons, the range of 6.8 miles. This regiment set to cover all the forces of 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 Firstly, Rommel insisted that the conquest of Egypt in the Suez Canal, not Malta, was the priority. Secondly, after the Battle of Crete in May, June, he was worried that his paratroops during the heavy losses. So he proposed a compromise to Kessel Reef that the invasion could be postponed. In May, Churchill said, we are determined that Malta shall not be allowed to fall without the battle being fought by the whole army for its retention. Its possession would give the enemy a clear and sure bridge to Africa with all the consequences flowing from that. And he asserted that the loss of water would be a disaster of the first magnitude to the British Empire. This view was supported by the First Lord and the Admiral of the Fleet of the Royal Navy. Hopes of the Battle of Gazala, which began on the 26th of May, put him to relieve the pressure. However, this outcome is the opposite of the pressure to increase. Churchill understood that war is a clash of wills. For two years, Britain had been powerless to challenge Germany's mastery of the continent. It was vital that it should be seen as fighting somewhere. The concentrated anti-aircraft weaponry and spitfires had to be seen to be doing something like it. Smokescreen covered ground derailed the offensive. By June 1942, there was a reduction in the air attacks, and the Axis logic here to neutralise the threat to their convoys. Kessling knew the police ability to capture Volta, but they were overruled. In June, July 42, it was advised that Volta now began to slack. By the summer of 42, confidence in Churchill's direction for the war and his authority would have been weakened further if he suffered from the loss of Volta. And this was an important consideration to him. By August 42, the fortnightly ration in Malta for one person was 400 grams of sugar, 200 grams of fats, 300 grams of bread, 400 grams of bread. The adult male would take 1,690 calories, women and children 1,500. They discussed the invasion of Malta, deciding to begin as soon as the Axis powers had secured the British fleet. The only British supplies that arrived in Malta was the diverted mine loading submarines carrying aviation fuel, anti-aircraft ammunition to Pedos, which had been captured by the Germans in Malta. The chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The German system of aviation fuel, the chief of staff said that Germany would have been able to do it. The with Rear Admiral Harold Burrow, who was a site of senior but agreed to serve under him in the Operational Pedestal as commander of the close escort of Force X. But look, I'm not going to go into all different forces, but there's a whole alphabet of them there. And I, I, I'm sure if I was a commander, I've got more mixed up, and I'd send the wrong one in at the wrong time to the wrong place. I mean, I, I've got it all here if anyone wants to look at it, but it, it just seems to make things a lot more complicated than where I'm sitting. He was commander of the close escort through to Malta and then we threw Admiral Bumley vice to command in their operations. The planning for operational pedestal began in late July. They wrestled with the decision as to whether the heavy escort should accompany the convoy right to Malta. We risked that the two 16 inch battleships would be heavily attacked by the enemy. And if so, the whole balance of naval power would be affected. The decision that they made was based on three assumptions. The fleet would approach the Sicilian Narrows, the most perilous section of the passage closest to enemy air bases between the 10th to 16th of August in the dark of the moon, so they were as invisible as possible. This meant the convoy would have to endure a full day at the mercy of Kesselring's aircraft without any carrier cover or Malta that based RAF support from Cyphers, Fort Seth. Uh, from Cyprus, of course, as they turned back on the evening of the 
from the borders. So part of the force route sailed to the Sicilian Narrows and then the half of it turned back again. The route hugging the North African coast around Cape Bon and neutral Vichy fringe Tunisia was significantly longer than straight, straight course, but due to the dramatic increase in access air streets since September 1941, this longer course was agreed to, which kept the convoy an additional 50 miles from Kestrin's bases, but doubled the length of Sapphire. On the 27th of July, Admiral Neville Seifert joined the convoy on battleship HMS Nelson. On the 9th and 10th, the convoy numbered 73 naval vessels and 14 merchantmen, including the tanker Ihola. This was not a convoy, this was a fleet and it sailed through the Strait of Gibraltar. Now let's talk about the Ohio. Quite a remarkable ship. It was built for the Texas Company. Later, Texaco was launched on the 20th April 1940. 9,265 gross register tons, 515 feet in length, and capable of carrying 170,000 barrels of oil, the speed of 16 knots, 30 kilometers an hour. She was the bankers fastest tanker of her era, the sister ship of Kentucky being uh, sunk in an earlier operation. Her method of construction was controversial. She was welded, not riveted, and she had a composite framing system with two longitudinally continuous bulkheads which divided the ship into 21 cargo tanks. She arrived in the Clyde on the 21st of June, 42, with an American crew, a three-inch anti-aircraft gun in the bow and one five-inch gun in the stern. She was requisitioned by the British War Shipping Administration. On the 10th of July, British Captain, Captain Dudley Mason, and 77 crew took over the ship. She was fitted with one ball force 40mm and six Autocom 20mm anti-aircraft guns. After special strengthening to protect her from the shock of bombs landing near her, she loaded 11,500 tons of kerosene and diesel and fuel oils. Fuel oils. Okay, the convoy, what a day, 11th of August. The aircraft carrier Furious flew 38 Spitfires to Malta and then turned around for job Gibraltar. There were actually four aircraft carriers in this convoy and, and the British Air Navy had seven, so they had made a tremendous commitment in terms of their aircraft <coughs> carrier strength for this convoy. At 1.15 in the afternoon, German submarine U-73 on four torpedoes at the aircraft. That's some of the boats, so ships, that <laughs> that were in Operation Pedestal, so you can see the, the types of ships they were. I'm not a naval buff, but uh, there's destroyers and battleships and light cruisers and heavy cruisers and corvettes and fine speakers. But anyway, that's just a little feel of the time that some of the ships, they're actually the names of some of the ships that were on the, in the convoy. But anyway, the summary of U-73 fired four torpedoes at the aircraft carrier Eagle, and that's it there, which sank in eight minutes, with a loss of 231 men, and all but four sea hurricanes, so a significant number of um, aircraft were lost when the Eagle turned belly up and went down, and people were just believe their eyes. A fifth of Pedestal's fire support was lost and a seventh of the RAN's entire fleet carrier strength went down. Now that's a little bit of Operation Pedestal. It, it shows you, um, if you look down the bottom, where the first is where Eagle was sunk. I'll leave it up for a while so as I talk you'll see when the various attacks occurred on the way to Malta. Actually we'll go further forward because I think there's some more maps there just to show you Malta as a strategic play, um, location for attacking the Axis supply lines. That night of the, of that, then the night of the 11th, the Italian 7th and 3rd cruising division sailed to engage the British convoy. This was a very big um, number of Italian ships that sailed to, to do this. Um, but what happened is the Wellington bomber dropped flares and sent messages bluffing about a fictitious B-24 liberated force was coming to attack them. However, Supermarina turned on its heel and cancelled its operation, not necessarily because of this uh, decoy, but because of lack of air cover. They were very vulnerable and limited fuel supplies. They 
didn't have enough to go very far. So that was a good thing. The Italians, if they had sailed down, I'm sure it would have, the outcome would have been very different. Churchill, on learning of the sinking of these critical ships, gave orders that future messages from the Elbow Chief should be upgraded to priority, most immediate, and delivered to him personally. So the 11th was a disaster. On the 12th, um, I don't think this is the Wolverine. We know this is a, a merchant ship. I'm just going to find. I think that might be the Wolverine. I, I haven't been able to be sure. But the Wolverine ran to tell him somewhere in Dagobah. The Dagobah sank with a loss of hands. But it had to go back to port, as you can see. It, it, did, a, it did itself a lot of damage. Um, by the morning of the 12th, the convoy was south of Sardinia and north of Tegisia Axis airfields. There were waves of attack throughout the morning, the Italian Stuka, with Thunderbolt fighters from Sardinia, and at noon the aircraft carrier Victorious and the, uh, another Navy ship, the Jacqueline, were hit, and, uh, the, and it was forced out of the convoy. Then the Italian submarine Balto was banned and sunk by the Imperial, so there were two submarines that were sunk by banning. Then at dusk, torpedo bombers bombed the aircraft carrier Indomitable, causing serious damage, which kept its 47 aircraft out of action, reducing the number of operational fighters available, leaving victorious as the last operational carrier. Yeah. So the, the uh, Allied weren't looking very healthy at this stage. Admiral Seyfried intended force there to turn west at 9.15, but they were just back where the, um, it gets very narrow. She made out of the range of Axis aircraft based in Sardinia, which is where the Lord is there. But because of the damage to Indomitable, he turned early to get it out of danger. Admiral Burroughs of Nigeria took over responsibility for sex, which was then going to sail from the very narrow part which is the north bit of Tunisia, that's the very narrow straits, onto um, Malta. He took over responsibility from Forsex to and Cypher went back to Gibraltar. And Forsex was four light cruisers and 11 destroyers. Then the foresight was hit and scuttled, and then at 10 o'clock that night, four torpedoes from the Italian submarine Axiom hit the Nigeria, the ship that um, Admiral Arrows was on, the Cairo, an old tanker which was scuttled, and the Ohio. Captain Burrows, who's in charge of this part of the convoy, he transferred to the destroyer Shanty, which was a mistake, which you'll hear about later. Aside from on hearing of the damage to Nigeria and the tanker Cairo, the order forced to send back some more ships to so that more ships to sail to reinforce X as it travelled on to Malta. Then at 10.30 at night, Christmas Star was hit with, and lived on its own. Just don't know how they do it, do you? The torpedo that struck a higher midships blew a hole 24 by 27 feet in the fourth side of the midships pump room. <coughs> it also blew a hole in the starboard side, flooding the compartment. The deck had broken open, and one could look down into the ship, and from being to being, the ship buckled. A huge pillar of flame ensued. The crew expected to abandon ship, however, while Captain Mason brought the effort to quell the fire as a forlorn hope, he ordered the shed engine shut down as burning kerosene bubbled up from the fractured tanks. His gyro compass was destroyed and the magnetic compass knocked off its bearings and his steering was out of action, forcing the crew to steer with the emergency gear shaft. However, the fires were put out an hour and a half after the ship was hit. Her engine started again and with a huge buckled side plate, she sailed erratically at 13 knots. In the meantime, Plan Ferguson was torpedoed and later destroyed. The Rochester Castle was damaged, and Empire Hope's son, and Kenya was hit by a torpedo. This left, with, left four sex with the naval ship, the main chest of the only undamaged cruiser. Then, on early in the morning of the 13th of August, the main chest was attacked from close range and scuttled. So there's not much left, is there? Then at 3.15 in the morning off Libya, torpedo boats sank these are all the, the merchant ships the Warengi, the Elmeria Likes, the Santa Elise and the Glenorchy. The Rochester Castle was torpedoed but escaped. In the meantime, almost by accident, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the British submarine unbroken was north of the Cape Malazzo and uh, we heard that the Italian cruisers and 
the Italian Navy was returning to port after turning tail. They had to be in the right place at the right time, and he damaged the Italian heavy cruiser Bassano and the light cruiser Vizio Attendo, and they had to both return to port, causing severe damage to both. That was a nice little uh, outcome for the Allies. By 8 a.m., the convoy was 140 miles from Malta, and there were more attacks hitting the Wamarama, which disintegrated and damaging the Northern Star, and hitting the Ihoa and Ihoa again. The JU-88 crashed into the Ohio starboard side, forward of the upper bridge, and exploded. Half of them hit the upper bridge, but the plane's bomb failed to detonate. Shortly after, another JU-87 crashed into the sea, then bounced onto the stern of the Ohio. There's a little story about one of the crew the rear, like on the aft of the Ohio, ringing and Captain Mason saying, I've got an aircraft on the, on the aft deck. And Mason said, I've got one on the front too. <laughs> so there's a little bit of humour, but uh, it's pretty confronting. Then two bombs fell on either side, lifting the vessel out of the water. As she had differential gearing, the propellers slowed automatically. Another explosion to starboard sent her really to port, with the boiler fire fires blown out. But within 20 minutes, I hire was steaming at 16 knots. Then another cell of bombs broke her electric pump, and at 10.50 she stopped, and the crew abandoned ship onto the um, Navy ship, the Pen, who had come to an aid and they destroyed the Ledbury. We left soon after to look for the Manchester. Then at 11 a.m., the Dorset was hit and abandoned, and the Port Chalmers, another merchant ship, was hit. The Navy ship, the Penn, attempted to tow the Ohio, but made no progress. Then another bomb hit the tanker, where the initial torpedo had hit, effectively breaking the map. Ohio was again abandoned for the night. However, the good thing that happened that night, at 4.30 in the afternoon, the London Star, the Port Chalmers, and the Rochester Castle reached the Grand Harbour for letter. So three merchant ships made it on the 13th of August. On the 14th of August, the next day, the Penn and Minesweeper Riot towed the Ohio at five knots until another attack broke the tow lines and immobilised Ohio's rudder. Then another bomb hit the Ohio's engine room. One small day abandoned ship. Two more ships, the Ledbury and the Bradham, joined. The Penn went to starboard, Ledbury acted as rudder, Riot towed. Then another enemy attack, 45 miles west, was broken up by the Spitfires from Malta. One 1,000 pound bomb landed in the tanker's way up in the stern plates, forming a great hole and breaking the tow line. The Ledbury was still secured to the Ohio, the right was towing it. The Ledbury was secured at aft and coasting the right direction. The pen and the Brandon practically lashed at either side of the tanker acting like two absurdly large surgical spoons. So there you have the Ohio with the ships on either side, and there's obviously another one behind her as well because she couldn't steer. Some good news also was the Brisbane Star arrived in Malta that afternoon. She had actually followed the coast. She hadn't gone with the other ships. She had uh, found her own way going, sticking to the coast near Tunisia. And she nearly didn't make it. As of Tunisia, she was boarded by the Sus Harbour Master, who wanted to impound her. And they took him into the cabin, they gave him some afternoon tea, they talked him out with the events and left him sail on their own way. So that was a happy story. Anyway, the Ohio arrived in Malta at 9.30 a.m. on the 15th of August. By the end of the convoy, the Ohio had been subjected to an incredible number of attacks, had been evacuated twice, for a gaping 35 square metre hole, had crashed German aircraft on the deck, destroyed rudder, and was only still afloat with the help of four other ships. As the 10,000 tons of oil were empty, I have settled on the bottom of the shallow harbour, and 10 weeks' food, supply of food, had arrived. On the 15th of August, two other ships reached Malta. Okay, so we only really had, I think, five merchant ships out of 14 that sailed, including the Ohio. But let's talk about afterwards to see, you know, whether this convoy made a difference. Was it worth the, the terrible losses? Um, 
for what the gain was. Despite the success of Allied convoys getting through, the response to the threat Malta was now posing to the Axis supplies to the Luftwaffe renewing its attacks on Malta in October, so it had a sort of negative consequence that attracted more attention to the island. Recognising the critical battle was approaching in North Africa, that is the second battle of El Alamein, El Alamein. Kesselwing organised the thick of, I'm sorry about my German, you have to, I'm not very fluent. <coughs> Flieger Corps in Sicily to neutralise the threat once and for all. On the 11th of October, there was a concerted attack on Malta, and by the 16th, it was clear to Kesselring that the defenders were too strong, and he called off the defensive. By this time, Malta had been reinforced with other aircraft. The situation in North Africa required German air support, so the October offensive marked the last major effort of the Luftwaffe against Malta. In November 1942, when the Axis lost the second, second Battle of El Alamein in late October and November, and the Allies landed in Vichy, French Morocco, and Algeria under Operation Torch, 8th to 16th of November, the Axis diverted their forces to the Battle of Tunisia, and attacks on Malta were rapidly reduced, effectively ending the siege. The German and Italian air forces flew a total of 3,000 bombing raids, dropping 6,700 tons of bombs on the Grand Harbour alone. More bombs rained down on Malta and Luftwaffe dropped on Britain. Mm -hmm. An important aspect of Pepstall was with each disaster it contributed to the next, beginning with the loss of Eagle. This loss of air cover through the next day deprived the fleet of a third of its takeoff and landing platform was a critical constraint on the number of planes that could be kept airborne. The crippling of the indomitable led to ciphered advancing withdrawal of Force Z, which allowed the Luftwaffe to have an unimpeded assault at dusk from Force X. That's at those straits when we turned back and left the convoy to go to Malta with no limited cover. Darwin's transferred the Ashanti. When he did that, he weakened his grasp on the convoy as his flagship and, and had um, BHF fighter direction communications, but the ship he transferred to the Ashanti didn't. So his ability to communicate with a lot of the other vessels and the aircraft was very limited. There was a lot of confusion, and really he lost control of the convoy and the ships in it, I would say, from what I have read. And a lot of the everybody seemed to pretty much do their own thing I mean, from then on. The Admiralty bore no responsibility for the limitations of air defence and anti-submarine technology which allowed waves of attackers to strike the convoy. The e success reflected the absence of higher direction and tactical skill amongst pedals of the escorts. They were you know, very low on the water. A bit like what's happening in Ukraine, I think, when attacking the Russian warships. The air battles also exposed basic flaws in pedestals planning, which the Prime Minister should have anticipated. As there was no supreme commander in the Middle East, the Navy prepared and executed the operation with no support from the British Army and little from the RAF. I alluded to this at the beginning. This is how it played out. Every nation in the Second World War suffered tensions between its armed services. If Churchill had exerted his will upon the other services, his soldiers in Egypt could and should have executed some diversionary attack against Rommel's forces that would have obliged the Luftwaffe to provide support. Kesselring was surprised that action in the Western Desert did not materialise, apart from a token bomber attack of enemy airfields in Sardinia and Sicily. And the Germans and Italians were astonished they were able to launch air operations with negligible, negligible interference from the RAF. Well, the question is, was Operation Pedestal a strategic victory despite the losses? Well, it revitalised the Maltese air offensive against Axis shipping, submarines returned to Malta, and slip fires from HMS Furious could attack, attack Axis ships. The question of whether Malta was a vital Allied strategic interest or an imperial sacred cow has divided historians since 1945. Arguments such as it was a matter of prestige and pride, a symbol of heroic resistance like Blue Diamond and Stalingrad, the George Cross Island, to be held at all cost. If the land campaign in North Africa had not developed so rapidly in the last months of 1942, Malta would again have been threatened with starvation. 
Post-war, the official line was the Mediterranean was a pivotal theatre, but not a decisive one, the Allied success with Malta. A vital, Malta, Malta a vital piece in the British campaign against Rommel's supply line. Some of the critics said, it was the largest aero naval victory won by Axis forces during the Mediterranean War. Another criticism was that the Commonwealth was a desperate throw by a Royal Navy which failed at its last gasp in the Mediterranean and Malta was secured not by sea power but by torch and Alamein. And finally, Malta was a strategic burden and a moral obligation glorified into a heroic myth. There were some more positive views more recently. In 2010, a historian in, the, in America said it was a clear operational success for the Allies. The Axis forces did not achieve their stated objective. And it was also said if the Italian fleet had attacked, as I said earlier, it could have destroyed the rest of the convoy and the British would not have regained their superiority over the Malta. The Axis propaganda claimed all the tankers in the Mediterranean convoy had been sunk. None had reached their destination. But the Crick's Marine report noted the incomplete and contradictory evidence and how the revival of Malta as an offensive base would affect Axis shipping routes in the decisive phase of the struggle for North Africa. A deputy chief of staff of, of Regia Aeronautica wrote that the British had achieved a strategic success in bringing Malta back into action in the final phase of the struggle for Egypt. And then later, in 1942, Admiral Big the Crick's Marine said the British operation, in spite of its losses, was not a defeat, but a strategic failure of the first order by the Axis, the repercussions of which will one day be felt. Interestingly, Kesselring makes no mention of Pedestal in his memoirs. Anyway, out of this operation, there were several awards. Malta was awarded the George Cross for the fortitude during the siege and the air attacks it sustained. Now this one I really do wonder about. Commander Seyfried was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of Bath for his bravery and dauntless resolution in fighting the important convoy through to Malta in the face of relentless attacks by day and night from enemy submarines, aircraft and surface forces. Now I've been cynical about that because he turned back and went, when got the tough got going. With that, but that's just my view. Captain Mason of the Ohio was awarded the George Cross for showing skill and courage of the highest order. It was due to his determination that, in spite of the most persistent enemy opposition, the vessel with her noble cargo eventually reached Malta and was safely burned. And finally, Roger Hill, he, received, he was of the Ledbury, the naval ship the Ledbury, he received a Distinguished Servant Medal and conspicuous Galgen Medal and mentioned dispatches for the bravery and ferry in the merchant into Malta. Operation Pedestal was the most heavily escorted convoy mounted by the British during the Second World War. It was run through to Malta in August 1942, as the island came close to collapse under a fearsome Axis air and sea blockade. With over a dozen merchant ships and a vast escort, Pedestal was to be the last chance for Britain to preserve its hold on Malta and possibly on the entire Mediterranean. By the summer of 1942, the British Empire's position in North Africa was precarious. Defeat against Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps at Gazala had seen the loss of Tobruk and Allied forces had been forced back into Egypt. The Germans were halted at Al Alamein at the start of July, but the overall picture still looked gloomy. One of the key problems of the British was the almost uninterrupted flow of Axis supplies arriving in North Africa from Italy. This was because the island fortress of Malta, which was in the best position to intercept Axis shipping, was itself under blockade by hundreds of German and Italian bombers and submarines. The island had gone months at a time without a single convoy getting through, and was suffering shortages of fuel, ammunition and food. By the summer, these shortages raised the spectre of a German invasion, which if successful would turn the central Mediterranean into an effective Axis lake. Churchill and the War Cabinet agreed that this prospect was simply intolerable, and so something drastic would have to be done. That would prove to be Operation Pedestal. Pedestal was an operation with a simple directive, get a single massive resupply convoy through to Malta, whatever the cost in ships. 
This would crucially include a large oil tanker, the Ohio, which would carry enough fuel to sustain Malta's civilian and military needs for 10 weeks. 13 other large, fast merchant ships were also quickly sourced from all over the UK and sent to Gibraltar, laden with supplies. Given the huge numbers of Axis aircraft, submarines and torpedo boats that Pedestal would face, it was given the largest and most powerful escort ever given to an Allied convoy. Surrounding the 14 merchant ships would be two battleships, four fleet aircraft carriers, seven cruisers and 32 destroyers, in addition to assorted fleet oilers and four corvettes. Three of the carriers would provide air cover to the convoy while the fourth, HMS Furious, carried 36 Spitfires to be flown off to reinforce those already on Malta. It was a huge escort, commanded by Vice Admiral Edward Seifert. On August 10th, the convoy passed Gibraltar and began its perilous journey into the Mediterranean. It did not take long for German reconnaissance aircraft to appear on the eastern horizon, but it was from the sea that the first blow was struck. Just after midday on August 11th, the German submarine U-73 managed to penetrate the screens and cross all four columns of merchant ships to hit and sink the carrier HMS Eagle with four torpedoes. It was a dreadful start but there would be no turning back. By the evening, Pedestal was down to two carriers, as Furious finished flying off her Spitfires and headed west, taking eight destroyers with her. It was then that the air attacks started. Initially, the convoy did well, shooting down four aircraft during a dusk attack on August 11th with no damage sustained. The next day, though, the attacks intensified. First, the merchant ship De Calion was sunk during an attack by 70 bombers, followed by the destroyer HMS Foresight in a raid of over 100 JU-87s and Italian Savoia 79s. Three bombs hit the carrier Indomitable and crippled her flight deck, further depleting the British fighter cover trying desperately to keep the Atlas bombers away. While this was happening, the convoy had begun to steam over a line of Italian submarines lying in wait. The Royal Navy destroyers went on the offensive, aggressively driving the subs away with depth charges. One, HMS Ethereal, actually rammed the submarine Cabalto, so desperate were the British to prevent torpedo attacks on the convoy. By this time, Seifert's ships were north of Bizert and approaching the Sicilian Straits. It was time for the heavy ships to turn back to Gibraltar, with air cover from Malta taking over from the single remaining operational carrier, HMS Victorious. Four cruisers and 12 destroyers were to be left as escorts for the final leg into Malta, with Seifret passing command of the convoy to Rear Admiral Harold Burrow. As the sea narrowed, flight times for Axis bombers reduced and the room to manoeuvre for the convoy vanished. As night fell on August 12th, the merchant ships were ordered to remodel themselves from four to two columns and the convoy was momentarily disordered. In the confusion, the Italian submarine Axum approached and torpedoed the cruisers Nigeria and Cairo, as well as the oil tanker Ohio. Cairo sunk and Nigeria had to turn back to Gibraltar, while Ohio was saved from succumbing to fire only by seawater rushing in through a gouge in her hull. It was to be the start of a torrid three days with the crew of the tanker. The largest significance of losing Nigeria and Cairo to the convoy was that they were the only ships to carry the radio sets needed to coordinate effectively with RAF fighters from Malta which made Allied air cover much less efficient over the coming hours. At 8.30pm, more bombers arrived, now striking virtually at will with a much less ferocious anti-air barrage greeting them. The merchant ships Empire Hope and Clan Ferguson were sunk and the Brisbane Star damaged. 45 minutes later, the cruiser Kenya was torpedoed but managed to continue limping along with the convoy. Just after midnight, German and Italian torpedo boats moved in, as the convoy fragmented more and more into a confusing melee. By the next morning, five more merchant ships had been sunk with more damaged. Worst of all for the British was the state of the Ohio, which had taken more damage after two bombers had crashed onto her deck during the night. Both her and the Brisbane Star were badly damaged, and the list of invalids was soon joined by the Dorset, hit after more bombers arrived just before 11am. Burrow could not afford to wait for these ships and pressed on, with Spitfires from Malta and the Odd Destroyer doing their best to protect the stranded vessels. At 4pm, with what remained of the convoy just a few miles from Malta, Rear Admiral Burrow detached, taking the two remaining cruisers and five destroyers with him back to Gibraltar. Two hours later, the Port Chalmers, Melbourne Star and Rochester Castle limped into Valletta. The race was now on to try and rescue the three ships still at sea. 
Nobody knew where the Brisbane Star was and the Dorset was sunk on the evening of August 12th, so efforts focused on the Ohio. The tanker looked for all the world like she would sink soon, but her captain refused to give up on his ship. Thankfully, three Royal Navy destroyers soon appeared, lashing themselves to each side of the ship and taking her under tow. The four ships crawled forwards at walking pace for the next two days, eventually reaching Valletta on the morning of August 15th. She was the last ship to arrive after Brisbane Star made it the day before, having gone on a wild detour that took her right up to the Vichy French Tunisian coast. The arrival of the Operation Pedestal Convoy was massive for Malta. The 55,000 tons of supplies delivered rejuvenated the island's stockpiles, and the arrival of more fuel and spitfires transformed the island's defensive picture. As the airspace over Malta became more secure, it became a safer base for British submarines and naval bombers, and Italian shipping soon began to suffer. In September and October, 27 Axis ships were sunk, including two tankers carrying fuel vital to Rommel's campaigns. Pedestal was a success, due in no small part to the courage of the sailors in the Merchant Navy. Captain Dudley Mason of the Ohio was awarded the George Cross, and Admiral Seifert's report was glowing about the merchantman. Both officers and men will desire to give first place to the conduct, courage and determination of the masters, officers and men of the merchant ships. This success came at a high cost however. Nine of the 14 merchant ships had been sunk, along with an aircraft carrier, two cruisers and a destroyer, with a variety of other ships really quite badly damaged. This raises the question of whether the operation was worth it at a strategic level, to which there is no definitive answer. On the one hand, while it's true that Malta's salvation increased the attrition rate on Italian shipping to North Africa, Corelli Barnett argues that this had little impact on Rommel's supply situation. In Barnett's view, Rommel's main bottleneck was not supplies reaching North Africa, but the supply lines on land from the ports to his troops, which were badly overextended regardless of what happened at sea. On the other hand, Malta remained a painful thorn in the Axis side not just immediately after Pedestal, but for the rest of the war in the Mediterranean, and saving it gave the Allies a perfect springboard for the invasion of Sicily in 1943. 